Have you ever had a serious problem in your life and you spent days and weeks and perhaps even months looking for someone to help you, someone to give you some definitive information on what it was that was causing this issue and how you might be experienced some relief from it? Have you ever experienced that? We all have, I'm sure. And how wonderful it is that when you finally get in touch with someone who can tell you what the problem is and tell you what needs to be done. What relief. Our biggest problem is sin. And we commit them every day. And there's nothing we can do about it. We can go to all sorts of other religious experts and they'll tell us what we think, they think we need to do about it. But there's only one who says this is what needs to be done and I will do it for you. It's our Savior Jesus Christ. He is the prophet who speaks with authority. May the Holy Spirit convince you of that authority. Your Savior's life, death, and resurrection as you worship your Savior Jesus Christ this morning. Good morning and welcome to all of you. If you're worshiping with us virtually, please send me a text message or an email. That information is useful to me. Let's join in singing the opening hymn.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose, sins, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Said to me, what they say is good. 
I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm of the day is number 29. We'll read it responsibly. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, and in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 3. In it, the writer of the Hebrews contrasts Moses with the Son of God. Moses was the greatest of Old Testament prophets, and yet he couldn't hold a candle to Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. Alleluia. Please stand for today's gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 1. We hear the account of Jesus in the synagogue of Capernaum and the people immediately recognize his authority. This reading will serve later as our sermon text. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. He's be seated for the singing of the hymn of the day.
of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from God's prop, the one and only Jesus Christ, your Savior from sin, dear fellow believers. So the younger you are, the less you might be able to identify with what I'm about to tell you, but please bear with me. It won't last too long. In the first 20 years of my life, I could count the number of experts in my life on probably one hand. There was my medical expert. His name was Dr. Daryl Angus. Dr. Angus lightly brought me into this world. He was my pediatrician. Uh, throughout the first, oh, say, decade of my life, he was also my surgeon. I went to him for sutures on more than one occasion, in fact, more than I can count. When I had an infection, he prescribed penicillin. They came in this little white envelope, and he would scratch the prescription on there in, in writing that I couldn't possibly read. <laughs> he was everything. He was my parents' doctor. When my mother, my, my grandmother came to live with us, he was her geriatric doctor. He was the medical expert. If we wanted to know something medical, we went to Dr. Angus. He was the guy. We had a guy like that, too, that took care of our family automobile. Everything from worn out wiper blades to a slipping transmission, everything in between. He was the guy. If there was a problem with our car, we went to him. We didn't go looking around. He was the guy. He was the expert. Same thing with home repairs. If my father could not make the repair himself, we had a guy. And so did everybody else in the neighborhood. And that guy could do it all. I don't care if it was plumbing or electrical or the, H uh, the furnace. We didn't have AC. The furnace. He knew exactly what to do. Bingo. He was the guy. We didn't call anybody else. He was the expert. When I was in school, grade school, and I wanted to dig a little more deeply into a subject that was not readily apparent in the book before me, like in science, there, there was a set of encyclopedia on a shelf in the back of the classroom. No matter that the thing was seven years old, no matter that it was obsolete on all sorts of subjects, the moment it appeared in print, that was the authority. There was the expert. If I wanted to find out something, if I wanted information, there it was, alphabetical order with color pictures to boot. How different life is today, some for the better and some for the worse. Some for the better because you have other experts out there and they're easy to get in contact with, some for the worse, and that you get confused. Am I really listening to expert advice or not? Is what this person is telling me the truth, the best advice for me to accept this moment or not? I don't know, there's all sorts of voices out there. In fact, some of them are saying one thing and others are saying another, exactly the opposite. What am I to think? So many experts. That's difficult enough when you're trying to get the best advice you can for an earthly matter, but imagine that happening when you walk through those doors this morning. You were just going to get somebody's opinion on spiritual matters. And there was also an opposing opinion on spiritual matters. What would happen to you? You would likely walk out those doors, and when someone said, yeah, this is what this rabbi said, you say, says who? I've chosen to follow somebody else and his advice for my life, and I'm going to stick with it. That was the situation facing the Jewish people in the synagogue of Capernaum on the day, as Mark describes it for us here in Mark chapter 1. In the synagogue, the regular practice was not the pastor or the regular preacher. Instead, they would invite an expert each Saturday to speak. That expert was usually a rabbi or a scribe, someone very familiar with what we would call the Old Testament, and that rabbi or that scribe would share some point of the Bible with them, and then his expert opinion. Unfortunately, that opinion had to deal with the minutia of Jewish faith and not the focus of the Jewish faith, which was on the promise of a savior. For instance, Every Jew knew that the Sabbath began at sundown on Friday, and we are forbidden to do any work on the Sabbath. So, what did the rabbis argue about? How many steps are you allowed to take on the Sabbath day before it becomes work? 
One rabbi would say one thing, another would say another, and still another, another. Or how about this one? If the Sabbath begins on sundown and I can't do any work after sundown on Friday, what really constitutes sundown? How dark does it have to be before I close the doors to my shop and no longer can make money on Friday? Those were the kinds of things these people heard on a regular basis. Can you imagine how frustrating that was? All these experts. And when someone spouted off what they considered to be an expert opinion, you could hear them saying out loud or even in the says who. But then along comes Jesus. On this day, on this Saturday probably, and Jesus speaks. And immediately, they recognize authority. And so on that day, as they walked home from synagogue and they asked the question, says who? They answered it, says Jesus, the Son of God. That's who. And that's a point well taken. A point let's take to heart as we make our way through this account of Mark chapter 1. I saw it the other day. It was uh, information airing on my television. It told me to be very careful about receiving information between now and November because of artificial intelligence. You've probably heard about it. Artificial intelligence allows anybody to make anyone seem to be saying anything. It looks like this person whom you've trusted for expert opinions and expert advice to be saying something else. And like I said, it looks just like them, it sounds just like them, but the warning is there, watch out. Be careful. The Jews of Jesus' day, as I mentioned, had this whole smorgasbord of expert opinions to follow. They weren't concerned about artificial intelligence, trust me, but they were concerned about receiving accurate information. And what they got was drivel, deadly drivel. Because too often the expert opinions they received were, this is how we ought to live as Jewish people. Do these things, and you can be sure you are a Jewish person and someone who is acceptable to God, and therefore, surely, when you die, you will live with Abraham in heaven forever. Drivel, deadly spiritual drivel. Jesus comes along and shares with them the word of God. Imagine that for a moment, people. You're not hearing the word of God from some other sinful human being like you are right now. You're hearing the word of God from the very Son of God. Words from the lips of God himself. And he's not sharing his opinion. He's sharing exactly what they knew the scriptures said. Incredible. Imagine that for a moment. Now, instead of these expert opinions, which had nothing to do with the Word of God, they were listening to God's Word, and immediately they recognized that it was different. It was doing something inside them that all those extra expert opinions never did. It led them to see their sin and their need for Christ as the Savior from sin. In other points of the Bible, we know that Jesus' message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. When Jesus went out and shared God's word with people, he didn't share his opinion. He shared clear law, which bites, repent, and then soothing gospel. Believe the good news that I am the Savior from sin. And when the people heard that, they recognized authority. Says who? Says Jesus, the Son of God. His authority is seen, is heard in his divine word. If you read through the Gospels, you'll note that often Jesus has a conversation with someone or a group of people, and then there is a miraculous sign, a miracle that he performs, which backs up what Jesus is saying. And that's exactly what occurred here on this Sabbath day in the synagogue of Capernaum. Listen once again. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all amazed, so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? 
a new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. In the world of modern sports, every winning streak must come to an end, sooner or later. And when it does, then the team begins on establishing another streak. Every streak must come to an end with a loss, but not in the Christian world and not in the kingdom of God. Jesus is on a winning streak that will never end. Before this account happened, we know from the Gospel of John that Jesus, or from the other Gospels, that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by Satan every one of those days. We have recorded for us the final three temptations. And every time Jesus was tempted by Satan, assaulted by Satan, he fought back and won. And now on this day, in his ministry, he comes face to face with one of those demons in a very unlikely place, a synagogue. We gotta wonder about that. If the devil wanted to do his work, why would he choose a synagogue? I'm not sure. But notice the posture that this demon caused this demon-possessed man to take. He said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? Think about what he just said. He absolutely knew who Jesus was, the Holy One of God, meaning the eternal Son of God. I know who you are, Jesus. And then he knew what Jesus had come to do, the work that he had come to do, which would culminate in complete victory over Satan. Had you come to destroy us? He asked. He knew that was coming. So why in the world would that demon have confronted Jesus, gotten into a battle stance with him on that Saturday? It doesn't make sense. Agreed. It doesn't. Because he was no match for Jesus. Jesus says, be quiet. I don't want to hear another word out of you. And the, and the demon is silenced. And then six words in English, come out of him. Be quiet, come out of him, and it happens. Oh, sure, the demon put up a fight, shrieks, etc. He was no match for Christ. No match for divine authority. Not even Satan himself. Says who? Says Jesus, the Son of God. His divine authority is in his divine works. And that's the way we like it. We love hearing the events of Jesus going out there and meeting Satan head on. We love it when we hear Jesus confronting his enemies and winning every time. Go get him, Jesus. We want to hear his authority again and again and again until, until it doesn't match what's in my heart. Lord Jesus, I heard what that person said. And I see what they did, but I know deep down inside why they did it. Jesus says, don't judge. How do you know, possibly know that? But we make those judgments all the time. Suddenly we don't want to hear the authority of Jesus. Lord, I pray in your Lord's Prayer, forgive me my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. But boy, I don't know. This time they really did it to me. And it feels good to want revenge and to think terrible things. Well, I'm going to hold on to this one, Lord. You're just going to have to wait. I know you've got authority, but right now, mine trumps yours. Just let me alone and let me be. Incredible, isn't it? And that goes on and on and on. You see, Jesus isn't just asking, demanding outward performance from his people. His word has authority and it goes right to my heart. It exposes the thoughts of my head and the attitudes of my heart, and over and over and over again, they are not in line with his holiness. I want my own authority. And his word convicts us. And Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. My grace, my mercy, my forgiveness washes over you, and that's what he does every day of our Christian lives. Our sins are washed away. My heart and my mind, although sinful, are clean in the eyes of God. That's authority. Even over Satan's accusations and my own guilt. You live with that authority because Christ lives within you. By his death, he has forgiven all your sins. And by his resurrection from the dead, he has made you certain of that forgiveness and eternal life and of his power in your life. Says who? Says Jesus, the eternal Son of God. That's the power 
That's the authority he has shown to you and he has instilled in you. Go. Go and share that power and that authority with others. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Having heard the word of God, we now make confession of the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, page 10. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became true and human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, in the fullness of time you came into our world to save us from sin and death. You ushered in the day of grace so long foretold. Beloved Son of the Father, revered by the Magi, baptized by John, you came preaching and teaching, healing and comforting, forgiving and encouraging. You brought the light of life to those walking in darkness and the joy of salvation to those doomed to death. Prince of Peace, shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. Open our own lips to speak your name to those around us who still live without faith or hope. Arouse us and our missionaries to flood the world with the light of your gospel. Lord of the Church, let your peace rule our hearts that we may use our gifts to serve you and each other in willing gratitude and joy. Watch over our loved ones near and far, that they may remember your love and rejoice in your salvation. Strengthen the faith of the sick and the disheartened. Give hope to those in despair and comfort those who mourn. Be gracious to all and lead us to reflect your love in everything we say and do. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home, where we will stand in the full light of your glory, and with all your saints and angels sing the everlasting song of triumph. Amen. Please be seated. As the music plays, please consider your response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. After that, the place will be brought forward.
And I have brought to thee, down from my home above, salvation, full and free, my pardon and my love. Great gifts I brought for thee. Come, bring thy gifts to me. Amen. Please stand. We'll now continue with the sacrament portion of the order of worship on page 12 of your worship folder. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. <laughs> Communicants, 
please follow the direction of the usher in approaching the front of the church to receive the Lord's Supper.
the Savior of Jesus Christ. Remember that for your sins. Please stand. We continue with the order of worship on page 16 of your worship folder. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. 
We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn. There will be an interlude between the first and second stanzas.
of his word and his works. May that power of Christ go with you in the week ahead as you live to his glory. Just a couple of announcements. As you noted in the bulletin next Sunday, we have our annual chili cook-off. It's a great time. You don't have to bring chili if you don't want, but I encourage you to do so. You line them all up. They don't know who made them, and then you test them and you vote. We've got other things to eat, too, so got to eat anyway. So come next Sunday. We'll have chili ready right after worship. Um, we have meetings that will uh, take place here real soon, uh, both in the fellowship hall and here. Uh, if you're coming to the voters meeting, you'll need a copy of this, uh, the annual report. It's on the table in the narthex. Uh, I will send out digital editions of this annual report as well as the February calendar and newsletter uh, in, a, in a couple of hours. Uh, that's it. Have a blessed day.